Good afternoon. Welcome. My name is Rawdon Briggs. I lead the transaction services team in Australia for Collies International. Today's the Collies International Agribusiness Team webinar is focused on Eastern Australian uh, Eastern Australia water markets. Your panel today are as follows. Uh, Nick Craner, National Director for Valuation and Advisory Services, Victoria. Um, he's going to speak around the murray Dali basically just a snapshot on that, and then moving quickly to the river systems of Tasmania. Following Nick will be John Harrison, Associate Director for Valuation Advisory Services, New South Wales. He'll be speaking about the northern river systems of New South Wales and then the um, Hunter region. After John will be uh, uh, in southern, um, uh, will be, sorry, excuse me, Jason Osborne, Associate Director of Evaluation Advisory Services, Queensland. He'll be speaking about the southern coastal river systems of Queensland. And then following Jason will be Sean Hendy, uh, Director for Evaluation Advisory Services in Queensland, leads the team here. And uh, he'll be speaking about the North Australian uh, Development Pipeline. And I'll close out with some comments around the permanent plantings, which is pretty much driving most of this water market. Uh, over to you, Nick. Thanks, Rawdon, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nick Craner, and I'm a National Director of the Valuations Business, focusing on the Southern Murray-Darling Basin areas and Tasmania. Before I discuss the trends and opportunities for irrigation development in Tasmania, it is important to provide some context as to what is happening in the Southern Murray-Darling Basin, which comprises the Murray, Murrumbidgee and Goulburn Rivers. This connected system is Australia's most traded water market. These rivers support the majority of Australia's permanent horticultural plantings, which are the highest and largest users of irrigation water in the basin. Persistent and extreme dry conditions has resulted in a significant reduction in the major storages that dictate the availability of water to irrigators. The basin's dams are at their lowest level since the millennium drought. Near record rain events would be required to replenish storages to long-term average levels. This lack of water availability is impacting allocations or temporary water prices in a negative manner from an irrigator standpoint. The BOM are forecasting a dry outlook for the rest of 2019, which will impact allocations in the 2020-2021 water year. Consecutive years of low allocations are likely to impact property values and investment appetite and create opportunities in other locations that we would discuss today. A structural shift in Australian agriculture towards high value crops and more efficient irrigation technology has driven demand for water. A declining pool of entitlements available for consumptive use has aided the capital appreciation of entitlements or permanent water, which is now trading at record highs. Allocation or temporary water in the Lower Murray or below the Barmer Choke is currently trading for more than $800 per megalitre. The vast majority of irrigators are adopting a hand-to-mouth approach to buying water with the hope prices will decline. Surface water on, in other parts of the basin is trading at a discount to the Lower Murray area. Intervalley trade or IVT is the trading of water from one river to another or from the upper Murray to the lower Murray and has greatly assisted the viability of large scale horticultural developments, particularly in the lower Murray area. We may see an increased risk of their water demands not being met if they are unable to access IVT from the Murrumbidgee, Goulburn and Barmer Choke. These structural changes to the Murray-Darling Basin over the medium to long term are causing, are providing, sorry, real opportunities outside of the Murray-Darling Basin for irrigation development. These opportunities are potentially becoming more compelling when the Murray-Darling Basin is experiencing a prolonged dry period, such as what we're experiencing at the moment. I'd now like to talk to you about the Tassie market, which is providing some real opportunity. 
like a lot of other states around Australia outside of the Murray Darling Basin or irrigation areas outside the Murray Darling Basin, water can be sourced from dams, rivers, bores, or TI schemes, TAS irrigation schemes. Um, bores in majority of the state in Tasmania are unregulated, which is an unusual thing for some people inside the southern Murray Darling Basin who can't really comprehend that, where we're seeing groundwater trades in in the order of two to four thousand dollars per megalitre and if you go to Tassie it's unregulate, unregulated in other words you can pump significant volumes or water outside of TI schemes is managed by Depipwi which is the relevant government authority down there and TI has deployed close to half a billion dollars over the last decade or so, developing irrigation schemes. This development has been relatively well taken up by landholders and driving a real land use change away from mixed farming enterprises to more intensive agricultural uses such as cherries, vineyards, apples, and potentially avocados. We are aware of one avocado orchard down in Tasmania at the moment, which is looking to expand. Water trades outside of TR schemes, unfortunately, aren't tracked by a central register yet. Um, so it is difficult to get a handle on what water with the outside of TI schemes is actually trading for. Trade parcel sizes in TI schemes are generally in that 20 to 150 megalitre parcel size. And are seeing um, more and more trading activity occur as the market becomes more attuned and sophisticated to the opportunities around irrigation in Tasmania. So what is the opportunity in Tasmania? Well, by mainland standards, water is still relatively cheap. Users within TI schemes do pay a premium for water over the PIP we users or irrigators that are sourcing their water directly from a river. There are a few reasons for this. There are infrastructure charges associated with that and managing the TI scheme. Often water is delivered to a farm gate pressurised and the surety levels or the amount of water available in a decade period, for example, is considered to be greater than perhaps some of the irrigators if you or I were just irrigating from them directly. So surety levels or the allocations in Tasmania are very sound and for a lot of irrigation sources in Tasmania, people can expect to get full allocation in eight or nine years out of 10. We're also seeing opportunities emerge in winter take licences and that's essentially harvesting the water outside of those peak summer month periods. Tasmania obviously receives majority of its rainfall during the winter months and a winter take licence permits an irrigator to harvest that water and then store it on farm for use during the summer months when they need it. So we're seeing a big opportunity in that space from either selling that water during to during the southern, summer months to other irrigators or using it on their own farms and there is a premium attached to farms which offer this benefit we're finding. So as a result of this uptick in throughputs in Tasmania we see real opportunity for processes as well um, particularly around vegetable production and, and the wine industry in the next five to ten years. Thanks for listening to my wrap of Tasmania. I'd like to now pass you on to my colleague, John Harrison, who's gonna to touch on the New South Wales market. Thank you, Nick. Good afternoon. My name is John Harrison, Associate Director within the Agribusiness Valuation and Advisory Services team based out of New South Wales. As mentioned earlier, I'll be touching on the Northern Rivers and the Hunter regions in New South Wales. As a bit of background, the Northern Rivers are geographically located in the northeastern pocket of New South Wales, 
stretching from Grafton in the south along the coast and up towards the Queensland border and mainly comprise the Clarence, Tweed and Richmond rivers. The region has attracted a wide range of agricultural crops, including sugarcane, which is grown within the fertile valley areas, and permanent tree crop plantings, mainly macadamias, bananas and avocados, with blueberries also growing the, grown in the area. In addition to these crops, Several beef cattle and dairy operations are positioned throughout the area. Rainfall generally varies from approximately 1,000 millimetres in the inland areas and up to 2,000 millimetres towards the Queensland, New South Wales coast. As a result of the reliable high rainfall characteristics the region possesses, historically there has been limited trading activity for water entitlements within the region. Due to the increasing population and the growth in tourism across the region, both local and state governments have been driven to develop plans in order to assess the future water requirements given the increase in domestic demand for water. As a result of this, water sharing plans have been implemented for the Clarence, Richmond and Tweed River systems. These plans are well underway and it is expected that the Richmond and Tweed area plans will be completed by July 2021 and the Clarence plan should be completed by July 2026. Given the dry conditions recently experienced across large areas of the eastern seaboard and the below average rainfall within the region in the past couple of years, we expect there to be an increase in water trading activity in the region as operators look to secure production moving forward, especially following the completion of these water sharing plans. This slide highlights the entitlement volume available and the number of licences within the Richmond and Clarence areas. It is worth noting that within the Richmond River area, there has been a ban on issuing new surface water licences since the mid 1990s in both the unregulated and regulated systems within the Richmond River catchment. The granting of new groundwater licences was also prohibited in 2008. In relation to the Clarence River, the Clarence Water Sharing Plan does not permit the granting of new unregulated river access licences and any new commercial developments must purchase entitlement from existing access licences. This highlights that there is a likely to be an increase in water trading activity in the region in the future. Of the total surface water entitlement throughout the plan area, approximately 47% is utilised for irrigation, 51% is for town supply, and the remaining 2% is for stock and domestic consumption. Overall, we expect that opportunities may open up for these market participants who currently hold significant water entitlements within the region with any surplus water to their requirements likely to be keenly sought after by growers looking to secure production. It is likely that the water trading markets in the northern rivers will mature and expand with an increase in trading activity expected in the future. In relation to the Hunter region, Demand for water is dominated by irrigated pasture production, vineyards and mining. It is estimated that in excess of 40,000 hectares of the region is utilised for agriculture. It appears that there has been a change in water use over time with water consumption for irrigating passes, pastures decreasing and water consumption for mining increasing. Water sharing plans have also been implemented for the region with the Hunter Regulated River Plan expected to end in July 2026 and the Hunter Unregulated River and Alluvial Plan expected to end in July 2020. In terms of trading activity, our research reveals that high security regulated river water is scarcely traded with no recorded trade since 2016. The majority of the trading activity has been for general security regulated river water. We have identified a good volume of transactional activity over the past 12 months, with trading values ranging from $640 to $2,500 per megalitre. Traded parcels 
have ranged in size from 3 megalitres to 170 megalitres, with rates towards the upper end of the range being for smaller parcels. More recently, we have identified a number of trades at around 1800 per megalitre, with these parcel volumes ranging in size from 150 megalitres to 170 megalitres. Thank you, and now we'll hand over to Jason Osborne, who will discuss the Queensland markets. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jason Osborne, Associate Director, Valuation, based in Queensland. I've been asked to provide a brief overview of water issues in southern and central coastal Queensland, being the Mary River Basin, the Burnett Basin, the Fitzroy Basin and the Burdekin Basin. All those areas have strong, a strong horticultural background, historically based around sugarcane and tree crops, but also small crops and forage production. In the past two to three years, there's been a rapid readjustment of land use, which has seen expansion of primarily tree crops being macadamias and avocados, often being established in ex-sugarcane land. A few points tonight about the development of a water market in, in southern coastal Queensland and the determination of water values is the long process progress of the water planning process which saw regulators, investors, agronomists, property owners and valuers develop a deeper understanding of issues around irrigation, irrigation methods, crop requirements, water reliability and so on. As market participants gained a better understanding of those issues, so did confidence around value drivers and the market and value of water in various catchments and locations within a catchment. Water reliability is key, and as the reliability of some of the irrigation areas became better known, they are attracting wide national and international interest. And I'm talking here about large investments by corporations into horticultural properties in and around areas such as Mundubra, Childers, Bundaberg and the Atherton Tablelands. What drives value? In concert with water reliability and water use efficiency, Obviously, profitability and prospects for individual commodities, particularly tree nut crops, are driving value, as already mentioned by Nick Craner and John Harrison. Within southern coastal Queensland, there's a shift away from flood irrigation to more water efficient under tree drip and spray irrigation for tree crops, such as macadamia nuts and avocados. As all will be aware, both of these crops have enjoyed increased demand due to marketing of their health benefits and in the case of macadamia nuts, a rapidly growing export market. While the recent free trade agreement has opened export markets for the citrus industries for those growers with sought after varieties. Other trend, we, trends we have noticed are the increasing use of good quality irrigation land for small crops and an increase in the construction of greenhouses, igloos and other protected cropping structures to offer better control of risk and better use of water. All of these has translated into a um, increased dollars per megalitre for the water and increased dollars for the developed irrigated hectare. A recent publication by the Department of Environment and Resource Management um, uh, sorry, generally speaking, the main water product for irrigation in Queensland is called the medium priority water allocations, which are separate to the land and can now be traded subject to various rules of operation. Overall water plan areas in southern coastal Queensland, the range in values for these water allocations is currently a broad range between $500 a megalitre to $2,000 a megalitre. In the Burdekin, average values are around $1,500 a megalitre. In the Fitzroy, the range is between $1,200 to $1,900 a megalitre. The Burnett, 1000 and even a little higher, while the Mary is between $460 to $600 a megalitre. Since the publication of the Department of Environment and Resource Management report, we understand that there have been trades higher than those listed above. 
as an example of where values may head, if we look outside the southern coastal Queensland catchments, we understand there's recently been a sale of around $4,000 a megalitre out of the St George irrigation area. Talking about valuation considerations, from a market transparency viewpoint, there are still issues with determining the value of water around how understanding how irrigation areas work, how reliably irrigators will receive water that they have bought, certainty around the data within the databases, and issues around apportionments on contracts for tax purposes. In conclusion, as there's better transparency and understanding around the water market and value drivers, a greater depth of market evidence will gradually emerge. This will likely translate to a period of consolidation of water values, but as with all markets, is going to depend on supply considerations of the crops grown. Noting the time lag until full production associated with many of the tree crops that have been planted in these areas. Thank you, and I will hand over to Sean Hendy for a viewpoint on irrigation in Northern Australia. Thank you, Jason. Good day, I'm Sean Hendy, Director of Valuations, Agribusiness Queensland. I specialise in irrigation and water rights across Queensland, Northern New South Wales and Northern Australia. Northern Australia is experiencing interest and growth in investment for high valued crops. It's described as a as that region located north of the Tropic of Capricorn. For some perspective, Northern Australia comprises 40% of Australia's land mass, approximately 50 to 60% of Australia's surface water runoff, but only has 8% of the developed irrigation industry. The Murray-Darling Basin, in contrast, has 20% of Australia's surface area, has only 6% of Australia's surface water runoff, but has 50% of Australia's developed irrigation industry. Therefore, the opportunity and the potential to utilise these land and water resources to increase Australia's output is enormous. It is creating interest and we expect this to grow. Investors are seeking more reliable and affordable water. And with record high water values in many parts of Southern Australia, the opportunity for arbitrage as land plus water plus holding costs to maturity are much lower than establishing uh, than purchasing established high valued plantings. These new areas also offer scale and research is identifying climatic suitability, which is increasing these opportunities. We are also seeing the local government authorities being very supportive of this growth, which will diversify their local economies. Overall market of force market forces are encouraging investors and established growers to investigate these regions as at the foundation of any business is the aspiration to grow and plan for future growth and in major traditional growing regions they are becoming less reliable and the tightening demand for land and water is placing pressure on available returns. Com capacity constraints in various regions are also limiting growth as water cannot be conveyed to areas where there is demand. However, with better irrigation systems and the new crop varieties, the new regions, non-traditional crop growing, are becoming more viable. Land and water values, by contrast, is, are very low. Is this a reflection of risk? To a certain extent, yes. However, the main limitations would be a lack of infrastructure and skills and water resource management systems are in the early stages of the development along with the defining of these water property rights. Recent, of, recent examples of investment have included sales and lease back of major permanent plantings. Another is one regional council is actively exploring a relatively new resource and is keenly being engaged by experienced horticulturists from Southern Australia to assist in the development of that industry at a local level. Finally, an established grower has strategically acquired over 1,000 hectares of land suitable for permanent plantings to complement the existing and future growth aspirations. Water values in these regions vary significantly, with values driven by the, the demand and the level of maturity in the water markets and the irrigation industry, the quality of the water rights, the tenure and tradeability, as water can be tied to land and may be difficult in detaching. Water values 
can range from $200 to $2,500 per megalitre for medium security water, with high security water up to $3,500. However, in many areas, the reliability of this medium security water is, is very high and is equated to high security. So the outlook and demand for food and fibre is growing as the world population uh, increases. However, it is the growth in the middle income demographic that is much greater than population growth that has seen the demand for food and greater food choices. The ability to meet this growing demand is being affected by sustainable use of water resources, many parts of the world being with water resources in many parts of the world being stretched. On a land use basis, irrigation in Australia represents only a very small percentage of our land mass. However, it produces about 50% of the total production of, of our agricultural output. So Northern Australia has the opportunity to play a very important part in our growth in production. It is forecast that the potential to increase our existing output from irrigation by greater than 50%. Significant research is being undertaken of Northern Australia's land and water resources, and there needs to be more work to complete to assess the potential impacts on environment, cultural and social values. However, it is and may be our last frontier. Thank you, and I'll pass you on to Rawdon uh, Briggs to conclude. Hey, Sean. Um, in conclusion, um, the permanent plannings that mentioned by all of the participants on the call today or panellists on the call today, um, that's what's driving these changes. And I guess the best case study in Queensland um, is is really around macadamias and avocados. Um, and the su Southern Sugar Belt, particularly uh, the, the Sugar Belt, the uh, Southern Sugar Belt change of water use is not an overnight event. It is over 30 years into a change cycle. Now the momentum towards permanent planning and protected cropping and high value horticulture is very clear. Macadamia nuts as a development land needs between four and five megalitres per hectare in, in the Burnett region and less in the northern rivers of New South Wales, closer to three. It's basically doubled in, in value in the past four years for circa 50,000 per hectare or land and water in combination. This is on the back of a five-fold increase in production tonnage in the last 18 years in this region alone. To give you an idea of the differences in, in hectares, um, the map to, to the right of the text uh, has um, mangoes being the smallest area um, in blue, um, macadamias are in green, and avocados are in just one moment, in, sorry, macadamias are in yellow, avocados are in green. So um, in the Burnett region, you've got 7,077 hectares of dry land and irrigated macadamias and 2,760 uh, 2, hectares of avocados. In the Mary region, by comparison, uh, a, a probably a more immature um, land use market in that it's more dominated at the lower end with sugarcane less by macadamias. 2,680 hectares of macadamias and 713 hectares of avocados. So you can see, um, as we get further through this slide, um, the differences in land values, where the Mary Valley is literally transacting at 26,000 per hectare land and water, and the Clarence uh, Valley in New South Wales at sort of plus 30,000 per hectare are now areas of of considerable focus for both institutional and uh, large family operations to expand and develop into. Development of export suitable fresh citrus areas are clearly increasing in the, in the you know, with the commodity price changes and the free trade access to markets. And these, these this rule pretty much applies nationally um, with suitable export varieties uh, now being planted across the country. Um, Collie's recently completed a sale of 644 hectare macadamia farm walk-in, walk-out, uh, which is a record for the country um, in Bundaberg from a USA-based client to a Euro-based investor. Um, they will go on, invest further, and I know they're, they're um, already implementing some changes on that asset, which will 
obviously increase employment and um, expand their business across the region. That Euro-based investor already has 19,000 hectares within the region. Uh, record avocado asset sale of Simpson Farms um, near Childers. Sale was to PSP and PSP's Australian partner um, in the region and is the largest since the Jasper Farms WA sale uh, two years ago, um, which was $180 million. Um, PSP's uh, purchase was significantly above that. Um, I won't state the number, but uh, as an enterprise value, it was um, quite a considerable transaction, including packing plants in Bundaberg and um, other enterprise, but basically based around avocados. Unregulated water provides diversity of supply, as mentioned by previous speakers, the panellists. Um, in, in a sub-catchment uh, region by region analysis, in these eastern river catchments alongside on-farm dams, they make up a very good complement and uh, also a very low year-on-year -year cost of um, maintaining an irrigated um, urban planning operation or protected cropping operation, having that in your mix. So refer to your uh, valuers on this webinar uh, to understand these asset by asset uh, nuances. So if you see sales, don't assume how that, how that is all made up. Uh, the panellists, uh, certainly the valuers in the slide, you, you need to speak to those because uh, as uh, mentioned by Jason, the transparency isn't uh, necessarily the market. You need to be speaking to people who are actually studying, understanding and certainly analysing those um, sub-regional sales, including unregulated water. Um, in conclusion, um, please reach out to everyone on the anyone that you need to ask questions via email, or you're welcome to use the the webinar um, chat or question capability, and we'll compile those questions, send them to the panelists, and um, uh, the best person will come back to you via email with any answers required. Very much appreciate your time on the slide on the uh, webinar today, and um, we look forward to uh, um, you joining us on our next webinar, which will be probably February March next year, uh, subject to be confirmed. And um, and we uh, bid you a good day. Thank you.